Okay. All right. I turned on the recording. It says. Oh it's my God! It's recording. Maybe we should introduce <laughs> ourselves real quickly. <laughs> like formal but yeah this is the, this is we stumble into the intro it's perfect yep. all right here we go. what oh i was gonna say you first okay fine, fine. <laughs> hi i'm chanel i am piper nell of the piper nell podcast and i'm talking with Mars! Hello, everybody. I am Mars of the Brownberry Chronicles podcast, and you can find me on all the socials as Hey Brownberry. And I'm Piper Nell on all the socials. So, Very okay. Convenient. All right, now we're talking to each other, not to yes. <laughs> we, we decided we were just going to jump right into the recording yeah. part of all of this. So, this, collab- this hands fun collaboration has been so fun so far. And now I've realized that I have everything with me since. Um, yes, <laughs> to me. That's okay. fine. <laughs> okay, I have both braids that are dyed. I have the unspun one. Oh, let me get the spun yarn. Oh, perfect. So while Chanel is picking things out, I will give you guys an introduction to what we'll be talking about. We have decided to do a fiber and yarn dyeing collaboration, mm-hmm. and I'm just completely in love with this idea of sister strands because I'm just going to say that that's a really cool way to refer to these mm-hmm. these pieces of fiber in their different forms. But That should be the name of our project, Sister Strands. Like, that's so yeah. good. <laughs> I love it. So we just, we just decided that we were going to share this collaboration with all of you. Yeah. Um, How did we start this project? I forget. Like most things, came up in a random conversation. <laughs> yeah. We were like, hmm, I want, so the story behind this collaboration is that we were both wondering, hmm, I wonder what would happen to fiber if we spun it first, then dyed it, versus dyed it first, then spun it. Yes. Um, exactly. so, and the time uh, was yeah. because I had just started dyeing yarn, mm-hmm. and you've been, you had been spinning before that, if I remember. I mean, I've only been spinning for about a year, come to think, like, yeah. thinking Same about it, and not dyeing yarn. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both newbies to this part of the craft, spinning and yarn dyeing, and that's probably why our brains got to thinking, what would color be like when applied in these different formats? Yeah, I definitely remember asking that question, and I'm, we're still finding out the answers. It's true. <laughs> the good thing is that you had an opportunity to go and get us some Yes, fiber. I did. And so, I had already done some yarn dyeing, so I was feeling a little more confident about how to apply color, but I had never done fiber dyeing. Mm-hmm. And so, and I don't know, have you, I'm sure you've worked with dyed fiber before, but maybe I not have. from someone that you know. I don't know. Yeah, um, I've worked with hand dyed fiber before. I usually spin roving. Yeah. Um, wherever I buy it from, actually, I. Oh, I, I'm cheap, so I always get it on D-Stash, but right. they are dyed, so I, I kind of get like the seconds of the dyer, which is Gosh, fine. Yeah. That's fine with me. And You've been it, able to spin it. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's our collaboration. I have a yarny business called Dynamics Yarns, and my oldest daughter and I have been doing mostly acid dyeing of bare yarn and sock blanks, and we've played around with different methods to apply color and we've played around with different yarn bases but we had yeah. tried fiber dyeing so i have recorded the process of dyeing some fiber that chanel gave um, so tell them the story of the fiber yeah, i'll tell you where this fiber is from so i went to rhinebeck last year it was in november right anyway yeah, whatever october i think which is the new york sheep and Wolf festival mm-hmm. so in 2016 just a few months ago i went to new york sheep and wool festival in Rhinebeck and I went to the Mickey Mountain Farm which is a small farm in Vermont. They specialize in actually raising mohair and thin sheep. So mm-hmm. mohair which comes from goats. Yeah. Okay, but thin sheep is a just a breed of sheep. They had one of the fibers I got is thin sheep. The other one is BFL. I'm not sure if the BFL was also raised on their farm. Probably. Mm. So both fibers 
which I have some of the unspun BFL oh, right now. Yay. Yeah, it's comb top, which means that if you have the fleece from the sheep, it gets it gets sheared, picked, cleaned, everything. Um, and then once you have the wool all clean, then let's see, how do you make comb top again? I'm trying to remember, but comb top's different from roving because it's combed so that all of the fibers are aligned in the same direction right. as opposed to roving where there's still some randomization and airiness in it. Not it. So comb top can be spun in, oh, I want to make sure I get it right, in a worsted style. Okay. That all of the fibers are aligned in the same direction and have like, while I'm, while the spinner drafts and spins it, the air is all squeezed out of it, making a very dense, tight yarn. That's fascinating. Um, single, a single, at least. And that's versus a woolen spun. Woolen spun, which can be spun from roving or bats or roll eggs, where you introduce a lot of air instead of squeezing it out while yeah. you spin it and draft it. Hold on, let me just fact check myself real quick and look. Yeah, that oh. never hurts. So when Chanel went to Rhinebeck, she had, we had already discussed this collaboration. So yeah. she went to Rhinebeck with the thought that she would find some fiber that would work for us that we could split. And um, I love the way we decided to execute this because it allowed us both to work in parallel because Chanel was able yeah. to actually start spinning the, um, the combed top half of the fiber that she got. And I was able to get my half and think about some ideas for dyeing. It took me a while to actually get to doing it. I was a little intimidated because I'd never done it before. And I already knew that fiber takes dye a little differently than yarn that's already been spun. So either way, we were able to work in parallel. I know spinning takes time too, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm still spinning my half. I, I think my yeah. half's definitely the slower half, but. You did an awesome job dying. Well, thank for your you. So, yeah, think, it's really interesting. The process that my daughter and I use is we we try to do what we call minimal water waste. So oh, we don't do a lot of large pot kind of vat style dyeing of skeins because mm -hmm. um, I feel like you end up throwing away a lot of water when you do that. So we are more likely to do um, a low simmer, kind of low and slow. So we're more likely to do less water fewer skeins at a time and apply color to uh, to the yarn like almost in the same water that it's been soaking in because you want yarn that's damp to begin with so you pre-soak it before you apply any color and then to get a really rich color you usually wouldn't add too much more water as part of applying the dye so we want to powder powdered dyes in a little bit more water and then we tend to just use like if we were going to try to get a darker color for example We'll take water from that same dye pot, add more dye to that water, and then pour it back in instead of introducing oh. new water. And sometimes if a dye, uh, if, if the yarn that we use takes on a dye and there's still some color left in the water, we'll tend to use that for something else. We'll dunk a piece of cloth in there or we'll dunk another yarn in there and let that be a very light colored base so that... Cool. The so that that dye is not wasted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we did, we did that with yarn enough times that we were kind of comfortable with at least where to start and how to get the dye to, to stick to the fiber, which is to yeah. a heat cool. and a mordant. And I realize that we have not shown the braids, so we should probably do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're describing them in abstract. <laughs> we are. Yeah, so there they are. are. The braids. I'm guessing this one's the thin sheep. It feels more, it feels like it. Yes, and interesting you mentioned that. So there was a thin sheep and there was the BFL, and they feel very different, and they took the color very differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they look very different. Let me hold them up side by side. So the fin is the lighter one. Yes. So and the BFL the is the color different. is also more spread out, I feel yeah. like. Whereas in the BFL, the color really seeped into concentrated. The yeah. The dye, um, we use the same concentration of dye, color, and water. We we measured that out. Um, 
we soaked both braids beforehand. So we pretty much kept everything the same. Um, but with the fin, what happens with the fiber is it will take on as much dye as each strand can take. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is left in the water that surrounds it. So with the fin, when we would squeeze out the braid, mm -hmm. dye would come out in the water. Oh. So with it, the BFL, it, yeah, yeah, applying the same amount to the BFL, when you'd squeeze it out, clear water would come out. Oh, whoa. There was just a very interesting difference right from the dyeing process. So that's why that one is much more muted. Mm-hmm. Each Did time we would go back. Did you go back and re soak it again? And did it take we up more did? Time? So, what happened was we we had them in the same pan at one time, and when we did the first kind of squeeze to test what we call exhausting the dye, which means when you um when you remove water from a dyed skein or strand, uh -huh. the water comes clear, you call that you say the dye has been exhausted, it's basically all soaked in, right. When we first squeezed the fin and we saw there was still dye in there, we're like, okay, we want all that dye to go back into the fin. So we were kind of like yeah. sopping it in back into the to the braid. Um, but it just, after multiple rinses, it wouldn't take anymore. Huh. Okay. So it's just, I think it's just a some kind of property of that fiber. I don't know a lot about the different bases, but that was my guess, that they just, the, the actual strands of the wool are just different. Huh. So you think that fin might just have less capacity to absorb dye than BFL? Yes, I think so. Um, and the the even the braids as bare fiber just looked so different. Mm -hmm. Like one was a little more lofty, and the other one was more dense and compact, like you said. Yeah, and that's how I actually when I got the braids before. I mean. This was my first time asking you and checking with you which one was yeah. which. I could feel which one was the thin sheet because I remembered spinning the my half of it. By the yeah. way, in total, we got eight ounces of each kind of okay. wool. And got four ounces. Yeah. Right. I remember labeling the bags with that. I was just telling the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I took out the two braids and then the one that was, I think, dense is the yeah. word here it, it's denser um i mean that doesn't mean that it doesn't squish down yeah so efl when i squish it just all of this air comes out and then all of this air comes back it in, back in. yeah so there was a lot of space for dye to sit in there and and find room so the the dye solution in the bfl just seemed to have lots of places to go and sit and stay <laughs> Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, it was fun to do. It was no more taxing than yarn skein dyeing with the dyeing and rinsing process. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting part of the application was when you're dyeing yarn that's wound, say, in a, in a hank, I'll call it, so just yeah. rounds of strands, there's a lot of ways that you can apply the dye. You can make it in color blocks mm -hmm. along a long hank or you could dip one end of it and leave and in one color and dip the other end in another color um, you can hand almost hand paint it so that you just do small strands of a certain color all around the hank but with the braid we thought okay the best way to do this is to hand paint it yeah. so we poured dye into an area and pressed it into the yarn and this so, is while the fiber is braided the well, fiber is, is right. So no, the fiber actually wasn't braided while we were dyeing it. The fiber oh. was a loose, I don't even know what it's called in the fiber world, but just the top. Just yeah. Top so the top we, we made the top, um, we laid it out in a pan, in a metal pan, and kind of made a like a long, skinny set of rows of top from each one so that we had access to the whole thing. And it was soaked in warm water because heat is part of the dye fixing process. And so we were able to take, pour a little bit of dye with a squeeze bottle into a section and press it into the fiber. Oh, cool. We did that at, with each color, we did that in different areas of the top. So when uh -huh. we were working with brown, for example, we would do a concentrated little block of brown here, then go a little further down and do some more. 
and we did that so that you can see the color distribution throughout and then yeah. we did, okay let's do some red here and then some areas we just left bare on purpose yeah i really like these bare spots mm -hmm. so with the fin there wasn't as there wasn't uh bare spots because i think what happened is just a little bit and yeah, just a tiny bit better, right definitely less dye yeah so the dye just distributed much further out and around all on its own it's like capillary action which yeah. you know, it's like it just sucked it up and spread it out into an area without us having to move the color around yeah i'm really wondering that, it didn't yeah. stay a darker deeper color because it didn't stay concentrated to one area so how many co different colors are in each braid three I'm looking three I'm three, guessing three intentional colors red, yellow mm -hmm. brown red yellow and then cool. you have the you have sort of the accidental coloration of some orange and some tan and some green even i, was yeah. gonna say, I really like this kind of like russet red mm -hmm. red bleeding into the browns yep yeah. so that just happens naturally which is really cool i have an example here of my daughter's speckled yarn Ooh! oh yeah that's what you're making your sweater out oh her yes. sweater out of and if you really look closely at the strands there are these areas where a red speckle and a brown speckle collide or a pink and a purple collide and it makes this whole other color which is just really neat so there was some of that happening in the fiber i'm wondering if the one of the causes of the difference between how they take up dye is just the property of each of the individual hairs so right now i'm looking up the micron count of oh which is basically how fine each individual hair is mm -hmm. it says that thin sheep is well well thin sheep come in a lot of different colors wow I'm on like, <laughs> now you know i'm on a general of uh, thin sheep information page because i'm guessing it's not a very kind of trendy breed so a lot of right have i hadn't heard of it before you um offered it up as part of the collaboration yeah um and the way i kind of decided on getting the fiber from misty mountain farms was first they're pretty local to me I'm New Jersey cool. now. and when i was back in college a friend of mine had sent me two bags of their thin sheep and mohair locks uh -huh. um and come to think of it in that one the fin was also really muted in color. So both the mohair and the fin sheep locks had been dyed. So locks are basically almost raw wool. They're clean. Yeah. So all the lanolin and the oil has been washed off, but they're still mm -hmm. in little clumps, like you just sheared it off the sheep. Ah, okay. And you could definitely tell the mohair was very saturated. They had all been dyed like kind of a lavendery purple. And yeah. the mohair had been become saturated and it's shiny because it's naturally shiny. Yeah. But the fin was a more muted, mauvey purple. That's so that's really that is just how it takes on color. Yeah. Um Yeah, I have to think that has something to do with the actual strand and scales of that wool. Yeah, so fin wool it has a micron count from 24 to 31. In contrast, some of some people might have heard of at least how fine and soft merino is. Yeah. Um, most commercial merino is between 18 and 22, I believe. So I hear from that that the higher the micron count, the lower the softness potentially. Right. So when you see like Super fine merino is probably somewhere close to 18, maybe. I've heard of like 17, maybe wow. micron mm -hmm. merino, which is super squishy and soft and fine. Yeah. Um, let me look at BFL. Yeah, I think of BFL, which is Blue Face Leicester. I think of that as a, a woolier wool, so a little bit more hardy than yeah. Merino, but it it seems to be a very popular base BFL. Yeah, it's I wonder if it's how sturdy it is, or it's it's micron count maybe not super soft, but also 
offer a lot of strength and sturdiness. That's my understanding. It's pretty soft. Um, and the fiber is also, so I guess thin and BFL are both considered medium wool. Okay. BFL fiber has a micron count of 24 to 28. Interesting. And so the two fibers are actually pretty comparable in fiber. Okay. And thin sheep and BFL also have similar stable length. So stable ah. length is when you have the fiber and if you were to pull off a little bit of it, this is basically the length of an individual, of the hairs on average. Right. So this I would estimate is about six inches. Yeah. And that's normal staple length for both EFL and thin sheet. So mm -hmm. the interesting thing is they have comparable staple length, like hair length, and comparable hair width. But they huh. pick up the size so differently. So I wonder, wonder too, in the preparation, once they're prepared off the sheep and uh, turned into combed top, mm -hmm. I wonder if they just react differently to that process as well. And then the fiber, the spinnable fiber that you get has, it's, has unique properties. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I can talk about the spun yarn now. So since yeah, that'd be awesome. The properties of the wool. So the thin sheep, my half of the thin sheep is all spun up. So this is what it looks like in the skein. So this beautiful. is my first skein on the Nitty Naughty. It looks so nice compared to mine. It's so good. <laughs> so um, the fin sheet, this is the fin sheet spun up. This is a little bit of what the BFL I have spun up is looking yeah. like. I think it's blowing out a little, sorry. But um, just by looking, you can kind of see the BFL has this halo. Yeah. It's scarier looking. It's also a little tiny bit yellower just in terms of color and it's a little bit darker yeah. but that's not i don't so think already the the fact that the bfl is a little more lofty mm -hmm. is a total guess but it makes me think that it just made more room for the dye yeah i'm going to be really interested in how these skeins will die up once they yes. get to you but i think that the way that i spin could also affect how dye takes up so okay. as i mentioned before there are kind of two polar opposite ways to spin wool there's woolen spun which is you're letting air go into the wool as it as what what you're called when you spread it out to spin drafting mm -hmm. um, and then there's worsted spun which is you're trying to squeeze out all the air as you spin it um, I'm not the because I'm not the most experienced spinner I'm definitely not the most consistent so some spots will have I, I tried for a semi woolen spun, okay. but it did because I'm squeezing out air from the top as I spin it, it was kind of straining my hands. So, in some spots, I was definitely letting in more air. And so, there are more woolen spots. It, there will be a mix of. Different. Well, that's cool. I think even that, that means down to each strand, we'll be able to see what the differences are. Yeah, in the thin sheep, let's say like this strand right here is really dense and finely spun. Right. Whereas you have this this spot, which is more. You oh know, yeah, I see that. Spun and fluffy. I see so that. I think there's going to be a really interesting difference between those, and so we'll have to film an update when you dye them. Definitely, <laughs> I'm excited about that. And in yeah, fact, I'm going to try if I can. I will include in this episode the video footage of Adachi and I going through the process of dyeing the fiber. Um, I'll put that at the end. And if for some reason I'm not able to figure that out in the editing process, then I'll definitely link to that video yeah. footage. Mm -hmm. And I have video footage of me spinning the BFL. I wasn't able to get footage of me spinning the thin sheet, but there you can see I'm spinning on a drop, a drop spindle. This is a top whirl spindle that in total it weighs 0.9 ounces. So it's a pretty lightweight spindle. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm aiming for as fine and consistent of a single as I can. And the parts of the spindle, you have the shaft, mm -hmm. this is where the single as they spin it up is wound onto. And this is the whirl, which is why it's called a top whirl because as I'm spinning, the unspun fibers hanging out here, my hands are drafting it and 
the and the twist travels up from this hook into the unspun fiber. Interesting. Yeah. And it and it collects right underneath that whirl on onto the right shaft. Under, that's where I wind the already spun fiber onto. The hook kind of disrupts where the twist likes to travel. And yeah. actually the world does even more since I hook the fiber into the full. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really the only, what I'm controlling where the twist goes by mm -hmm. where I pinch with my fingers. Oh, okay. where I pinch with my fingers is where the twist won't travel. My fingers will get in the way of that. Lock it. I can do that. That makes so much sense. I would love to see it. All right. All right. So let me just grab the little bit of VFL that I had. Um, so this, I had just applied the second ball of the BFL, so my spindle was cleared, so you're also going to get to see me set up a single. Because the proper way to start a single would be to tie a leader yarn onto it. Okay. Um, and that's just any any yarn that's already been spun, just tie it onto your spindle and so your fiber has something to grab onto. Right. But I'm too lazy to kind of grab <laughs> a separate, a separate yarn so i just hook on a little bit of fiber yeah spin it up and just use that as my starting point so i'm rolling it along my leg and wrapping it out oh i see yep and when i get a little bit more i'm going to take it off the hook and really start winding it onto the shaft so there's a process where you spin the actual spindle against your leg mm -hmm. and it's and for a good amount of time it's it looks like well that one i only kind of really flick it off my leg my leg okay. and I'm, I'm just letting it hang and spin got it so it kind of came off the hook but that's okay it's still plenty of that's twist. amazing i check the amount of twist by letting by just giving it some slack and seeing how far it twists up on itself okay that's a healthy amount of twist that you want when you're spinning to ply the yarn. Okay. So now I'm going to take it and hold it onto the shaft and just crank it a couple of times uh -huh. to wind on. So now, now I'm set up for the rest of my spinning. Oh, this wow. Yeah. Oh, it and makes me want to do it I now. Hook, <laughs> <laughs> I hook the single into the notch. Right. And then wind it around the hook a couple of times. And now I'm just ready to keep spinning and drafting and letting the twist Oh my up. goodness. And now your only limitation is how much you can hold on the shaft? Yeah. And in between, when I wind like an arm's length or so, I don't want to wind longer than I can reach. Okay. Um, I don't want to spin longer than what I can reach um, because then I won't be able to wind it taut onto my spindle. I'm impressed. I'm as impressed with the fact that you can talk and spin as anything. <laughs> really kind of mindless. I, I kind of use spinning as a meditative exercise because when I really concentrate on it, it can take all of my mind oh. um, really focus on how the twist is traveling into the fiber. Right. How my fiber as I'm drafting it is coming out in a controlled fashion. Right. But yeah. Okay. It's, I've, I really just enjoy spinning. That is a beautiful process, and I love that you use it in a meditative way. Are you doing anything special with your hand that's holding the fiber? Um, I'm, I kind of pinch. So I pinch the unspun fiber between my uh, thumb and index finger, and then I kind of take the rest of my fingers and just wrap the fluff around so it doesn't get in the way. Got it. But I'm not doing anything with my other fingers, really. Yeah. Besides I, maybe guiding it so toward you can where... see why people fall for it so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a single ply, and you have, I've seen on the fin, you have two plies, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Is that, so, what's that process like? Maybe you can show us that at some other point, but can yeah, you describe it? I, I can take a video of me plying at a later point. I do want to spin up more single before yeah. applying to this. But basically, once I've spun up enough single to fill up this spindle, yeah. it doesn't hold much. It holds less than an ounce because oh, wow. if you think about it, if you have an ounce of fiber on it, you've more than doubled its weight. So right, okay. 
significantly different when it's fuller sure than when it's empty it might throw off the the it's revolution harder to, because if you have a heavier weight on the bottom it's just harder to pull out the amount of fiber you want because it's pulling out so strongly yes yeah so the control a little bit of that control goes away it does yeah and i'm a control freak so. <laughs> That's awesome. I guess the only option if you want to be, if you want to be spinning ounces at a time is probably a wheel, right? I have to think yeah. most spindles can only it handle. depend on the weight. I mean, I think some wheels, I, I haven't spun on a wheel before, but that's my goal for this year to get a wheel. Ooh, fun. I, I think some wheels would still, um, their uptake, what, what that's called, the fiber getting sucked in and twisted it could vary based on how much is on the bobbin and uh -huh. wheels have bobbins instead of spindles now or at least most contemporary wheels do so sleeping beauty can't prick her finger on the <laughs> right it actually has it at both ends so there's no sharp point right okay gotcha yeah i can see why people fall for it because you go you can i guess based on how you buy the starting material you can go very quickly into what's essentially a finished object exactly. a finished product of some kind even if it is just that single ply i mean you've made something yeah <laughs> you've already I, created something new i actually have still have never knit with my hands spun so when you said finished object i, I felt a little <laughs> guilty but I'm definitely going to knit with at least one of these things. Yeah, no judgment, no judgment. I would love to knit with your hand spun. And yes, I told, that's why we did sharesies, so that we can have parts of the process all the way through to creating something from those yarns. Because I think even those will look very different between the breeds and yeah, the other so spun. Excited. All of that. I've, yeah, I've gotten a lot more into just examining the way things are done. Um, I started out you know, following patterns and buying yarns that are just really commercially available. And I've moved into doing a bit of design or at least being more comfortable modifying patterns and thinking more about the actual fiber that I want for a specific item. That's so awesome. it's like a, it's, it's just a progression over time. Yeah. I feel like spinning has given me a huge appreciation for how each yarn is constructed. Yeah. And really getting a feel for the yarn before it gets knit up. Right. Maybe as I knit with my hands spun more, I'd also be like I'd be more easily able to visualize what the spun yarn will look like knitted up. Yes. Well, I thought about that as we were dyeing the fiber. Um, it's part of the reason we left some areas undyed because when we've done it before with yarn that was already spun and and comes in a hank whenever you have a little bit of space between colors it tends to highlight the colors yeah it does so in what we imagine is in the process that you just showed with spinning you're going to be introducing these little blips of undyed yarn and yeah. hopefully that will make the colors in the resulting yarn stand out and then you're going to be plying it onto another set of strands that have color at different locations and that's actually so that's what i'm a little worried about so yeah. hand spun tends to mute colors because of that mm. blending that you saw that you just described yeah when i buy a yarn onto itself um it's probably the the two plies well, I'm doing a two ply. You can also do a three or four, however many plies. Sure. Um, but I'm going to do a two ply, and I'm a little worried about the plies from the two, the colors from the two plies blending and just kind of making the whole thing look a little muddy. Yeah. Thinking I'm going to spin it, maybe, maybe I'm going to divide the fiber in half lengthwise Ooh. and then spin up both halves and then ply those halves. Oh, yeah. That would keep the colors together. And even if it doesn't exactly line up, there will be a little, like, kind of the fade effect. Yes, there will be sections of color mm -hmm. together. That's a great idea. See, that even has you thinking about the way you spin. And just as I was thinking about where do I apply this color on the fiber? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Who did we know many, many conversations ago? Yeah, little did we know that we'd have so many things to ponder. Yeah. Um, in this, the is, process. this is the idea. I mean, that was the point of the whole project to explore our two ways, of, our stages of dealing with fiber. And we could keep updating it. And eventually, when we knit with the knit or crochet with the yarn, we can kind of keep updating people on how. That'll totally be another step. I, what I would like to do is to have each of us knit something that is very different in size, like socks versus a shawl or a cowl or a cowl, because that would that would then have um, lengths, row lengths or round lengths that are very yeah. different. So it will express the color differently. Ooh. Yeah. Why not, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so awesome. I'm really glad we got to catch up on this. Hey, I think this, before, is but this time I got the explanation. <laughs> of what's happening. I hope it made sense. I know it did. if I could understand it. <laughs> okay. I'm glad. By the way, if you are interested in starting to spin, I am running the spindle along. That's talk more about that. That's right. So I'm currently hosting a spin along just in my little Ravelry group. Um the and Piper Nail Podcast Ravelry Group. Yes, the Piper Nail Podcast. And if you're Spinning anything on a spindle. I'm not being picky about with their new. I don't know what the equivalent for cast on is in spinning. Spin on, join I on. I feel like I feel like cast on still applies. <laughs> I feel yeah. like you're casting on to the spindle. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, if I, I'm not picky about if you started spinning before May or if you just started it or if it's already in progress. Um, but yeah, if you're spinning anything on a spindle, you can enter it in my spindle along. Spin nice. S A L Sal. Sal. Spin yeah. along. Yes, the spindle along. Nice. And, and the yips are welcome. Yarn in progress. I'm doing all of the book. I'm doing all the bookkeeping, and my idea behind it was that spindles are pretty accessible for beginners mm. in terms of cost too. So you yes. can get a beginner kit on Etsy for, I was looking at a few shops and $15 to $18 gets you wow. a table and some beginner fiber to work with. If you so, think about already, if you think about yarn and a pair of needles, you're already beyond that price point. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty great. And so what, when does it run until? It runs until July 16th because I figured I would do the giveaway on my birthday. Yay! Yeah. Fun. I hope that many people participate in that. Listen up, Brownberry Chronicles viewers. Mm -hmm. You're already a spinner or considering starting. Join Chanel and get into the Ravelry group. And I find that whenever make-alongs of any kind are happening, there's so much help and encouragement. There is. And that's, I think, a good way to start. will definitely benefit from that because it can be a little frustrating at first. Yeah. Uh, get the feel of drafting the fiber and it probably would come out all in one bunch as it's done for me many times ah right but you can post and get commiseration sure also, to encourage beginner spinners i am so i'm doing all the bookkeeping with someone just has to post their project and if it's the same project they can keep posting but i'm just going to count it once got it but if it's their first if it's their first project spinning project ever then they get a bonus entry. <gasps> and if they finish the spinning project, then they get another bonus entry for That's each. amazing. Yeah. I want a spindle. <laughs> get a spindle. The thing is, what I don't need is a fiber collection. I have collections of making things to work through, but don't count me out for the future. All right, all right. <laughs> it just, uh, it looks to me yeah. like a very meditative, kind of soothing practice, so. Oh, it definitely is. Me. And I can, I can teach you if you want to just like video chat some time. And that would be amazing. Virtually. Did you learn from another person or did you teach yourself? I learned, I learned in college. Okay. And the fun fact I like to tell everyone, every spinner goes, oh, is that I learned from the daughter of the woman who founded Paradise Fibers. Oh my word. Yes. She so went to my she... school. <laughs> 
Yeah. I think, did you tell that story in an early podcast? I think so. That I'm not sure. That familiar. It definitely sounds like the kind of thing I would have said in one of my college episodes. That's amazing. Yeah. I ask because when people say, I'd like to be able to knit a hat or I'd like to be able to knit socks, one of my first thoughts is, this will go so much better if I can just sit down with you and go through the first steps. Because I oh. think there is so much potential for frustration yeah. that having someone there who has had that same feeling as you before. I go too. So. Yeah. Then you, that person can say, yes, all of your first cast on stitches are going to look wonky. Mm-hmm. You are not, you haven't somehow failed at your first try. This is how it goes. Um, and just to be able to explain things the way you did just now with, with getting started. Oh, thanks. To me, it works really well with person to person, even if it's virtually. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I was teaching someone to spin virtually. We were Skyping. Yeah. I don't know if I should mention her name, but. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's a, another wonder of modern technology is you can learn a new skill from someone and yeah. wow, they can see how you're progressing, which I think is a huge part of it. You can tell someone, okay, this is why that doesn't feel right, or it's not looking the way you planned. It's, it's because I can see that this is happening. You know, you're now holding someone, Now someone just needs to invent a way for us to like literally reach through the screen and be like, no, 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 it's this way. <laughs> That's coming next. Hang on, give me that. Give me the sock and let me show you. <laughs> give me that. No, don't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah somehow or another things like that will uh will come eventually right or we'll just teleport to the person hang on i'll be right there <laughs> or just i mean you, there's probably like a little portal or something you stick in your hand and you're there. yeah yeah <laughs> well, why why not? look at the things we've invented so far why not <laughs> this stuff used to be like on the jetsons oh yeah so yeah who knows but for now i think it's great that there are so many ways to pick up a new skill. And I think one of the things I've fallen in love with, with fiber arts in particular, is all of those steps. Yeah. Um, I saw posted on an Instagram of someone I follow that they're growing plants to use for dye, to dye fiber that they will, I assume, based on what they currently do, they will dye fiber, spin that fiber, knit with that fiber. I mean, that's wow. like so many steps in a process that um is ancient but feels like it's becoming new again yeah and i feel that's so awesome that people can participate in so many steps that that's true that's true you can find whatever thing appeals to you or do all or some of it i was watching a podcast um in have you watched uh, the Flame and Fiber podcast? I have not. I don't think that doesn't sound familiar. So she just picked up her first fleece and was talking about how she's processing her first fleece. Right. Uh, mm, <laughs> I need to do, but don't really have the funds to do right now. <laughs> so. Yep. Think about the the different festivals you can now go to just, yeah. just by changing which part of the process you're into at the moment. <laughs> point i want to try all of the different parts of the process why not, not, why not? make a hobby out of it but i definitely right. want to try every part so that's i can say I that's available a shawl or a sheep or a sweater mm-hmm. i know I and mean, there's people who've decided you know what i love yarn so much i'm gonna raise sheep i mean <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of options all right, you ready, Mars, for our for the Piper Nell and Brownberry Fiber Farm and Natural Plant Dye? Sign me up. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm ready because I seem to be progressing in that direction. Have you tried natural dye? Well, I have not done it yet, but I was having a conversation about it this morning oh. and realized that just in the way my family eats, mm-hmm. um, avocado is an example. I I am already lamenting the number of avocado seeds that have gone into compost and outside of my house. I mean, at least you're composting them. Not throwing yeah, them. now I'm going to be collecting them. I put everybody in the house on notice this morning. Um, <laughs> and I happen to live in, a, in an unincorporated area. It's very rural. Mm-hmm. So I know that I could forage and find a lot of plant life that I can use. Oh. So I have, I mean... 
Like if pine needles, I haven't even looked this up, but if pine needles are something you can boil and get color from, I could start a business over here. <laughs> we have so many plants and areas where I can go and find different things that I'm really interested in trying it out. I, I need to learn more about the process, like mordants and the things that help to affix natural dye to wool. Um, because I know that that's an important part of, of having it come out well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm very, very interested in it. I think that I'm looking at my yard in a whole different way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> like, oh, what wonderful things lie out there. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's so cool. Yeah, I will come eventually. I think that the process of learning about it is exciting enough right now. Yeah. So about the mordants, so do the acid dyes that you use kind of have their mordant built in? Because you don't need anything additional to fix it. No, they do actually. Oh. Um, vinegar is a common one, or was, I think vinegar was used more commonly a while back, um, and some people still use it. You can tell if they've used it because you can smell it in the finished yarn product. Like Mad Posh? Yes, but we use citric acid powder. It's an organic food grade citric acid powder that we dissolve in water. And that seems to work really well on most animal fibers. And we also have soda ash, which is in powdered form. And soda ash tends to be better for plant fibers. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have any kind of, um, I'm trying to think of a blend that we had that had some plant, like linen. We had an alpaca linen silk blend. Oh, that's a really interesting one. It was, it's lovely. I've only got a couple skeins of it left, but because the linen was in there, we used soda ash as the mordant because with plants, they don't tend, they don't have the same scale structure as animal fiber strands. So they don't tend to hold the color. And even that, that yarn with the soda ash, has a much more muted color than some of the wools that we've done. Oh, okay, cool. So no, with um, natural dyeing, there's a whole other kind of mordants. People use alum, um, which is a kind of, I think it's a potassium salt. And uh, yeah, I don't remember. Use, I'm trying to think of what's the other. I saw even a recipe that called for alum, cream of tartar, and oh. whatever the plant is that you, you I mean, know. That cream of tartar, I remember using it as a, not a mordant because I wasn't dying anything, but as making meringues and it, it's supposed to bind the ingredients together. That's mm -hmm. so cool. I know, right? The things you learn. Yeah, there's all yeah. kinds. I know there are different kinds of mordants and then also things that impact the way the color is expressed, like I've heard people use copper pipe, and that changes the way color from a natural dye is expressed. I have so much to learn. Where's the, all the dyers out there are like screaming at me right now? <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm sure some of the more experienced spinners were screaming at me or <laughs> explaining my bit. But yeah, I was gonna. It's about, a lot of uh, uh, trial and error. I think is part of it too, based on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I was going to ask about, I've heard that of people recommending kind of like iron supplements to help with yeah. what What ingredient do you get out of those? So I, the iron itself, I know people use iron flakes in natural dyeing and in eco printing. And I think that's a similar, um, it has a similar kind of fixing property. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about eco printing like on fabric. But I've heard iron mentioned, like even taking rust off of iron and adding it to the solution that you're using to dye. That's really And I do know that some of the primary things you need are an acid and heat. Okay. So there are different sources of acid you can use too that are, that are natural. Yeah. That's so cool. I, I mean, I see a lot of potential for just reusing materials in natural dyeing. Right. That's a great way to promote reuse of things I'm that you buy. You, my away. yard and the things we buy at the grocery store, I'm looking at them all very differently now. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, like onion just, skins, like, we tend not to put onion skins in our compost as much because our compost is not the standard covered lid compost. We, we have a pile in the yard and it's around a couple of plants that really like a lot of um, rich soil. So we just keep piling it onto the same area and onion skins blow all over the place, which is not that big a deal. I mean, it's more an aesthetic. So now I'm like, oh no, we're saving all the onion skins. That's, that's something that we eat a lot. And I, love onions. I could, you know, I could be storing that up to a level where we could get a nice rich yellow dye out of that. So do you get different colors out of different colored onions? I, wonder, I don't know. Because like a red onion skin is very different from a Vidalia or something like that. Yeah. Well, this is going to be fun. Ooh, report back. <laughs> what I want to do is get a huge pot and an outdoor um, kind of flame stand, something where I can literally light an actual fire under a large... Um, metal pot oh. and just let that pot collect rainwater and then be like okay I have enough water to start a fire and light underneath this pot <laughs> let's put some avocado seeds in there oh, cool. and then let's do some dyeing that's your burner yeah oh, that's awesome. cool. so I'll let you know I may, yeah. I may document that process as well <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad we got to chat today. Yeah, this Let's see how much spinning you've gotten done. You've been, you're busy over there. Oh, I am. I love it. I, no, I, I could still spin a lot more onto the spindle, but it's okay. got a, I've got a healthy cock. That's what you call the wound spindle. Got cop. a healthy going on. Okay. Cop, I don't know exactly why. I think it's short I'm for something. learning something. Yes, and I learned a lot on your end. Good. Well, I hope, we hope that you all have learned something too. Be sure to comment on the video. Yeah, if you're a spinner, a dyer, a knitter, a weaver, we love to hear from you. Um, part of the reason we do our podcasts is to connect with other people. And yeah, it's more. documentary learning because we're all just, we're all learning bit by bit in this world. That's true. That's the exciting part. There's something we still don't know about some part of this whole There's journey. so much we don't know. <laughs> So feel free, um, this video will be posted on both of our channels. Feel free to comment and find us as Piper Nell and Hey Brownberry uh, around the interwebs. And we'll be back with another part, part two at least, to this process. Of our project, right? We are. I'm part so excited. All right. We'll work together on getting that yarn dyed up. That's going to be so cool. Yeah, so by the time we come back, our, our goal seems to be we'll have dyed, finished yarn. Yes. Right awesome. now we have yarn in various stages. If there's a part three, then it'll be hand-dyed, hand-spun yarn that's been knit into something. Oh, my God, knitted or crocheted. <laughs> or crocheted. crocheted with hand-spun would be really cool, that texture. <laughs> oh, this project has... Did it make it a, into your blanket? Oh, oh I, I have to. It, it might not be sturdy enough. That would be great, though. Mm -hmm. It could be the start of my non-superwash crochet blanket. All right. Yeah. That would be an honor. Why not? Okay, so. We shall see. Yep. Suggestions welcome. <laughs> yeah. so if any questions on both of our channels, and also don't forget to like, subscribe, everything, do the, all the things. Come chat in our Ravelry groups. Yeah, we love thanks so much for chatting with me, Mars. Oh, it's my pleasure, sweetheart. I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. Will do. And you, you sounded like you were off to a nap. I am going to just kind of hibernate a little bit. I may um, watch some, I'm watching um, the Call the Midwife series on Netflix, which is cool because some knitted garments pop up in there every now and then. And I'm sort of a Britophile. I love all things British movies, TVs, documentary, TV shows and documentaries. So I may fall asleep to some of that. <laughs> We're recording this on Mother's Day, so oh, I have to be a little lazy today. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a great lazy Sunday. So, yeah. I hope yours is stress-free and I will see you soon. And happy Mother's Day to everyone. Thank you, sweetie. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Whenever you see this, I hope it was a great one.
Bye for now. Bye. Wait, are we actually hanging up or are we just... <laughs> I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop the...